The story of human history isn't set in stone. Unless we're talking about the history of the past 100 years, nobody was there in person. We can't rely on eyewitness testimony, and we can't even rely on written records because of the possibility of bias. All we can do is piece together the evidence and try to make sense out of it. Sometimes a discovery is made that changes the established historical narrative. And that's what this video is all about. The history of North Central Mongolia has been challenged by the early 2020 discovery of two incredibly elaborate tombs that appear to have been built for the rulers or aristocrats of the Xiongnu Empire. Prior to their discovery, they were thought to have been nomadic people who dominated vast swaths of the eastern Eurasian steppes 2,300 years ago, but didn't settle down in any particular location. They're best known by historians for the war they waged against the ancient Chinese Han Dynasty, a war that the Chinese took so seriously that it motivated them to build enormous fortifications against their frequent incursions. These fortifications eventually became the Great Wall of China. While much of their history is still mysterious, we can say with certainty that a purely nomadic people wouldn't have built tombs that contained such elaborate grave goods. The larger tomb has become known as the Tomb of the Silver Dragon because of the gilded dragon artifacts that were found inside it. A jade-decorated sword was also found in the same tomb, the first of its kind ever to be found in Xiangnu territory. The history of China is far better known and understood than the history of the Xiangnu Empire, but that doesn't mean it can't also be challenged. In March 2021, the discovery of a treasure trove of ancient artifacts in southwestern China shed light on the possible existence of a previously unknown civilization that once lived on Chinese land. More than 500 artifacts were discovered at the site, all of them made from precious materials like gold, jade, ivory, and bronze. The most striking of them, an elaborate but badly damaged golden mask, might once have been worn by a high priest. All of the items are around 3,000 years old and were recovered at the Sangxingdui archaeological site in Sichuan. The quality of the craftsmanship that went into the creation of the artifacts is far better than that of any other 3,000-year-old objects that have ever been found elsewhere in China. So it's reasonable to believe that they were made by a different culture. Chinese civilization is traditionally thought to have originated from this area, but now it seems that someone else was there before the ancient Chinese. Staying in China for a moment, the fossils that were discovered in the northwest of the country in July 2018 were first described as dragon fossils. That term is inaccurate, but the discovery has forced scientists to rethink the history of dinosaur evolution. The fossils belong to a species called Lingwulong Shengqi, early examples of sauropods with long necks who lived 174 million years ago. They pushed the development of advanced sauropods back in time by 15 million years and provide us with a new origin point in a chain of development that would eventually result in better known giant dinosaurs like the Diplodocus and Brontosaurus. Until this discovery, Dinosaur experts thought that all of these sauropods emerged around 160 million years ago and evolved into their best known forms over a much shorter period of approximately 5 million years. Now it appears that the process started much earlier and was far more gradual. The abundance of fossils found at this Chinese site suggests that the dinosaur lived in large herds, which is consistent with the later sauropods. This is also the first time that this subgroup of sauropods has been found in East Asia and might even indicate that East Asia was still connected to other landmasses at the time. Ancient Rome was one of the largest and most significant cities of the ancient world. As of March 2021, we now believe that at the peak of its archaic period, it was even bigger than we've always thought it was. The theory revolves around the discovery of an enormous 2,500-year-old building right in the center of the city. The former dwelling is remarkably well-preserved, including its original wooden beams, clay walls, 
and even parts of the roof. While it's known that this site in the Quirinal Hill area was within the city's border during the time of King Servius Tullius, it was believed to have been a necropolis. The ancient city's residential area was thought to be further toward the south of the city, close to the Forum. While it's still probably true that residential life in archaic Rome was centered around the Forum, we now have to accept that there were residential areas scattered much further afield. It's highly unlikely that this grand home was built in isolation, so archaeologists are now on the hunt for other, probably smaller, homes in the immediate vicinity. We know we've only just left China, but we're going back there now, because it seems that there may be a lot of information about its ancient history that we've got wrong. It took two full years for archaeologists to excavate, explore, and fully understand the ruins of Shimao City. But now that they have, the official history of this part of the country is in tatters. Shimao is now accepted as the largest prehistoric ruined city in China, built around 4,000 years ago. There isn't much of it left today, but in its pomp, it would have featured stone walls with fortified gates, palaces, workshops, tombs, houses, and enormous sacrificial altars. Such is the advanced nature of the outer gate that it was long thought to be only around 2,500 years old. But archaeologists now have undisputed proof that it's far older than that. From the murals, jade artifacts, and shards of pottery scattered across the site, we can be sure that this was the richest and most important city in the region. Life in China 4,000 years ago was obviously more sophisticated than we thought. Elsewhere in China, hiding beneath Fushan Lake, are the remains of a great pyramid, one that might have been built long before the famous ones in Egypt. Fushan Lake is enormous, covering more than 100 square miles in the Yunnan province and over 500 feet deep at its deepest point. The first signs of the suspected pyramid were identified and photographed by diver Zhang Wei in 1992. When he returned to the site with professional archaeologists, they also found walls, roads, earthenware, and what appear to be stairways. More important than that, though, is what looks a lot like a 70-foot-tall human-made pyramid of a similar style to those built by the ancient Mayans. The stepped pyramid has five stories and is stepped, with a base around 110 feet wide. Some historians dispute these claims, and while they acknowledge that there are ruins of some kind under the lake, ruins that must have been down there for thousands of years, they say that those who see the remains of a pyramid are simply seeing what they want to see. Who's in the right here? Has the shape of this once grand building been misinterpreted, or is there really a lost pyramid at the bottom of this lake that dates back to the end of the last ice age? The oral history of the Hiltzuk people, who are the indigenous culture of British Columbia, Canada, tells of a strip of land that never froze during the Ice Age. Their legends say that their ancestors fled there when ice claimed the rest of the land, which enabled their culture to survive the cold. It was considered to be nothing but a myth until the 2019 discovery of a 14,000-year-old settlement in the region. The previously unknown ancient town was found on Trickett Island, not far from British Columbia's central coast. The island is in traditional Hiltzuk Nation territory, and 14,000 years ago, it would have been surrounded by glaciers. It's in the right place, and it comes from the right period of history. Archaeologists had to dig through more than 15 feet of soil and peat to find the ancient ruins but they eventually came across the remains of an ancient hearth surrounded by wooden tools. A few precious flakes of charcoal still remained in the hearth, and so it was possible to prove their age through carbon dating. Aside from proving the truth of the Hiltzuk Nation's claims, this also challenges what we thought about how humans first entered the Americas. The old theory was that they came from Asia across an Alaskan land bridge, but now, it appears they might have come by boat. The history of the Sundarbans, a region that stretches between India's Huli River and Bangladesh's Baliswar River, is very poorly understood. No known map of the region was drawn up until the East India Company bought the land in 1764. 
and it didn't have any formal system of government until the 1860s. Only a limited amount of archaeological research had been performed in the area until very recently, but it had always been assumed that the first humans arrived there around 1700 years ago. Now, thanks to a few artifacts discovered by a fisherman, we can push that timeline back by 600 years. Biswajit Sahu, a fisherman with a passing interest in archaeology, has collected a series of terracotta beads, small figurines, pieces of pottery, and religious artifacts while he's been out working in the area. And in 2016, he finally showed them to archaeologists. They've been able to date the figures to the Marian period of 2,300 years ago. The previous, somewhat sketchy version of the history of the region was drawn up by British archaeologists over a century ago, but they don't appear to have done a very good job. It's hard to imagine a discovery having any greater magnitude than the one that biology student Therese Salstedt made at the Swedish Museum of Natural History in 2015. While studying a few slices of rock taken from Chitrakut in central India, Therese identified the fossils of red algae. She knew the age of the rocks she was looking at, and so she also knew that what she saw through the lens of her microscope ought to have been impossible. History tells us that red algae first appeared around 600 million years ago and came from China, not India. Nevertheless, here was proof that the supposition was badly wrong. These fossilized red algae are one billion years older than the oldest Chinese examples. Not only are these the oldest plant-like fossils on record, but they're also the earliest examples of multicellular life ever recorded on Earth. Scientists are now faced with the daunting reality that multicellular life on Earth began hundreds of millions of years earlier than we thought it did. It's a world-changing discovery, and it's a scandal that Therese hasn't received far more credit for making it. This should have been headline news all over the world. How could one single coin change the history of an entire country? Well, you're about to find out. In May 2019, Archaeologist Mike Hermes confirmed the discovery of an ancient coin on a beach in the Wessel Islands of Australia. He says the coin is from Kilwa, a part of the world now known as Tanzania, and was minted in the 14th century. It's Mike's belief that the coin got to the Wessel Islands on a ship sailed by the Portuguese. It's always been known that they reached Timor in 1514, but Australia is thought to have been undiscovered by Europeans until British explorer James Cook arrived there in 1717. There's another coin-related twist in this story. In 1944, a further five ancient African coins were found in Australia's Northern Territory, and these coins are closer to 1,100 years old. It's possible that the coins somehow ended up here during the Second World War, during which the area was of key strategic importance in protecting the Australian mainland. But why would 20th century soldiers be carrying 9th century coins? Either these coins washed up after a shipwreck, or there were Africans and Europeans on this land long before Cook showed up. Most historians concur that the five known Viking Ring fortresses were built by the legendary King Harold Bluetooth during the 10th century. They do not, however, agree on their purpose. Were they an example of the king displaying his power? Symbols of the Christianization of Denmark? Or important strategic defenses? Might these pottery shards discovered in 2017 hold the key to unlocking their secrets? The ceramic pieces were found behind the main gates of Borgring, the most famous of the fortresses. They were made in the 11th century, which suggests the fortresses remained in use for at least a century, long after most historians believe it to have been abandoned. Subsequent searches revealed more pottery shards at the Eastern Gate, thus removing the possibility that the first discovery was an anomaly. Layers of ash found under the shards suggest that both gates burned down several decades before the pottery was deposited here, but that life at the site of the fortress continued after the gates fell. Rather than solely serving any kind of military or symbolic purpose, it seems that the fortresses might have changed over time and become residential. Alexander Joy Cartwright Jr. is generally credited as being the father of modern baseball. 
a sport that's popular in North America. There's a plaque at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, that credits him with that title and also claims he came up with the first coherent set of universally agreed rules for the game. Thanks to documents that came to light in 2016, we now know the plaque is dedicated to the wrong person. These 1857 Laws of Baseball, which had been sitting in a desk drawer, unknown and unloved for decades prior to their 2016 rediscovery, are written by Daniel Lucius Adams, known to his friends as Doc. He was the president of the New York Knickerbockers Baseball Club in that year, but it appears that the universal rules weren't agreed upon until the 1857 New York City Baseball Convention. Fourteen clubs met at that convention with a shared desire to codify the rules of the game. It was Doc Adams, not Cartwright Jr., who first specified that bases should be 90 feet apart and each team should have nine players. He also set the duration of the game at nine innings and specified the distance a pitcher should stand at. The plaque has yet to be rededicated, but on this evidence, it should be. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.